Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Care for the Caregiver. I'm Delany West, today's webinar producer. To make sure that you have a great webinar experience, I'm going to share some tips with you. Please turn your camera off and allow it to remain off. Please mute yourself and remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Become familiar with your window views, your gallery and presenter views. Find your chat window. Use the chat for your questions during the Q&A period. That will be to the end of the presentation. And be prepared to answer poll questions. Today, we're gonna to hear from Elizabeth Jones, our moderator, Teresa Rice, Susie Rice, we're going to have polling questions from Dion Jones, and then we have a personal account from Jacqueline Good, and then we'll have closing and thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Jones, President Greater Cleveland Chapter and National Third Vice President. Madam President? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. For those, morning. Of, you, for those of you who are not familiar with NCBW Incorporated, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women is an advocacy group that advocates on behalf of Black women and girls to promote leadership development and gender equity in the areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. Today's focus will be health. So I'd like to welcome you to today's health webinar, Care for the Caregiver, getting the support you need to overcome caregiver challenges. I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our presenter today, Ms. Jacqueline Good, for taking time to be with us this morning. Also, I would like to acknowledge our health care committee, Chair Ms. Susie Rice, members Dion Jones, Teresa Rice, and the coordinator today of today's webinar, who is technology chair for NCBW Greater Cleveland, Delany West, for coordinating today's virtual presentation. I will now turn the program over to Ms. Susie Rice for introductions of our presenters and panelists. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Rice, not Susie Rice, and I am a member of the Health Committee for NCBW and today's moderator. In support of our health trust, we bring to you today our presenters who will talk about caregiver fatigue. Our first presenter is Susie Rice. Susie Rice is the Health Committee Chairman for NCW. Susie has a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, a Master's in Education, and is a registered nurse. She worked in the field of nursing for over 25 years in various positions, including as a nursing supervisor at South Point Hospital. She's also a certified school nurse and retired from the Cleveland Metropolitan School District in 2003. Next, we will have NCBW member Dion Jones. Dion has a Master of Science in Social Administration and is a licensed social worker and a certified personal trainer. She also serves as chairman for records and reporting for NCBW. Dion will provide self-awareness then, our guest speaker will be Jacqueline Good. Jackie has a Master of Science in Nursing, a Master of Art, and is a clinical nurse specialist and a registered nurse. He has worked as a supervisor and as a travel nurse at various Cleveland Clinic campuses and other hospitals between travel assignments. Jackie also serves as the president of New Chi Chapter, the Cleveland chapter of Chi Eta Phi Sorority Incorporated, a nonprofit international nursing sorority. Jackie will give a personal testimony on her experience as a caregiver and the effects of caregiver fatigue. At this time, we will now hear from Susie Rice. Good morning. My name is Susie Rice. Good morning. 
My name is Susie Rice. This presentation is designed to help caregivers get the support they need to overcome caregiver challenges and make the process more rewarding for both you and the person you're caring for. If you are a woman, especially a black woman, you will more than likely be involved in giving care in the caregiver role. Next slide, please. What is caregiver fatigue? Caregiver fatigue can be summarized as when the caregiver feels physically, emotionally, and mentally exhausted. When they cannot carry out day-to-day -day activities without it taking a toll on our well-being. Allowing long-term stress to linger can and will cause caregiver burnout and fatigue. Next slide, please. As life expectancies increase, medical treatments advance. An increasing number of people live with chronic illness and disabilities. More and more of us find ourselves caring for a loved one at home. Whether you're taking care of an aging parent, a handicapped spouse, or looking after a child with a physical or mental illness, providing care for a family member in need is an act of kindness, love, and loyalty. Who can be a caregiver, you may ask? Any relative, partner, or friend that has a relationship or provides assistance to anyone with a debilitating condition. Caregivers generally provide a wide range of duties. Some of these duties may entail helping your person eat, drink, help them bathe, help them toileting, manage financial and banking affairs, manage communication, and maybe managing their medication. Next slide, please. Some common diseases that require caregiving. Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Parkinson's disease. Huntington's disease. Multiple sclerosis. HIV and AIDS developing disabilities, stroke, heart disease, cancer, and one that's not on the list, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. This is one of the disease I'm serving as a caregiver for my brother. He does not live in Cleveland, but although he has a ALS team, he will not allow them to do anything without consulting me first. So I'm always on call uh, when he needs me. My suggestion, if you're new to being a family caregiver, learn as much as you can about your family member's illness or disability and how to care for it. Seek out other caregivers. It helps to know you're not alone. Trust your instincts because you know your family member best. Don't ignore what doctors and specialists tell you, but listen to your gut. Encourage your loved one's independence. In my brother's case, because he had a team, he wouldn't do the things that he could do. He would often tell me, uh, they're here, so I just don't do it. I really had to start encouraging him to do as much as you can for as long as you can. Another thing, know your limitations. Be realistic about 
how much of your time and yourself you can give. When you know your limitations, ask your family and friends for help when you've reached it. It's not always easy to ask for help, even when you desperately need it. You simply made your needs known. You may be pleasantly surprised by the willingness of others to pitch in. Many times friends and family members want to help, but they don't know how. Make it easier for them by going over a list of caregiving needs you previously have drawn up. Pointing out areas in which they may be of service. Making sure the person understands that when you most need help, you can uh, count on them. There's also other places you can turn if you need caregiver support. You can turn to your church. You can turn to other caregiver groups. And there will be a list of those groups at the end of the presentation. You can turn to a therapist, social worker, or a counselor. You can also turn to the national caregiver organizations. Next slide, please. Susie, I, I, this is Teresa. I'd like to take a moment um, and ask you a little bit more about the concept of a caregiver for the audience. Um, on this slide and the prior slide, you gave examples about walking, bathing, toileting, things that appear hands-on. But then you also said that it's a broad range of assistance. And you gave the example of, of your brother, my uncle, and he, he lives a few hundred miles away. So for, for those of us who are kind of thinking about the concept of caregiving, is it fair to say that it's, it's a, a broader idea? as far as assistance, that it might not necessarily be something in your immediate area or more day-to-day -day, that it could actually be expounded upon as far as kind of the degrees or areas of assistance that we might be called upon to help with a close family member or friend or associate. What, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts, there are several types of caregivers. I have been involved in three different caregiving situations. The first situation was my mother who lived in Alliance and I stayed in Cleveland. My help with her was more monetary and on weekends I would go down and help my sister with it to give her a break. I would stay at the house on the weekends, me, my husband, and my daughter. I can't give my husband enough credit Whatever he could do for my mother, he did it. The second instance for myself in caregiving was my older brother. He was also from Alliance, but he was hospitalized in Cleveland. He was at the Cleveland Clinic for six months. If I was not working, I was at the Cleveland Clinic with my brother. I knew how stressed the nurses were, so I was there to do anything and everything for my brother. I, at one point, I became so stressed that I had, didn't notice it, but my husband did. He called my family in alliance and asked them if they would come, stay with my brother, and he took me on a vacation, which really helped. As I said, this third case that I'm working with my brother in Philadelphia, none of this is local. So initially when he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, I didn't believe it. I have never seen a black person with Lou Gehrig's disease. So I was really skeptical. But in talking to doctors, therapists, his ALS team, I came to realize that yes, he does have Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. So at that point, because I'm not with him, whatever he needed 
to have done. I would do it over the phone. I've talked to all of his therapists, his social worker, his doctor. Um, now he requires so much help from me because he has no one else in Philadelphia. He does not want to come home. And at this point, he can kind of manage with help. He needs help daily. And um, this is why I'm so involved with his uh, team. So I hope that explains a little bit about different areas, different ways that you may be a caregiver. You don't have to be there every day, 24 seven. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Common causes of caregiver strain. The first is role confusion. When you are just thrust into a caregiver role, it can be difficult for us to separate our role as a caregiver from other roles as a spouse, a child, or friend, etc. Unrealistic expectations. Many times as a caregiver, we expect our role to be positive and uplifting. But sometimes we're working with Alzheimer's patients who may never or re recognize you or even remember that you are related to them. How disappointing. Lack of resources. Sometimes caregiving becomes so frustrating because we don't have the money to take care of this person or the skills it takes to effectively plan, manage their care. Next slide, please. More common calls, causes. Unrealistic demands or unreasonable demands. Caregivers may see taking care of others their number one priority. But what happens when we have other responsibilities? How do we juggle these day-to-day -day activities? Some of us have the responsibility of being a caregiver, but we're also a husband or wife. We also have kids, we have a job. So it's really, really a balancing act. Losing ourselves. Many caregivers cannot recognize when they are suffering from fatigue, strain, burnout. They may even become sick themselves. Next slide, please. Susie, can you expound a little bit? You, you, know, you talk about caregiver strain and causes and some of the areas deal with expectations and, and resources and reasonableness or lack thereof. And, and there seems to be kind of an underlying theme that's kind of not spoken, but it's kind of the, the expectations of family that, or friends that at some point, if someone becomes ill, the expectation is to step in. And, you know, we talk a lot about long-term planning for ourselves, as far as wills and estates and, and powers of attorney and things of that nature. But, how important do you think is the conversation as far as the roles and expectations of especially our family as we become older or even in the age of COVID where we have these traditional diseases that you've outlined that happen as, you know, with age or certain factors, but in the, in the current environment where anyone can become sick, do you think that it's important or, or has some relevance to kind of have those crucial conversations that if something happens to a family member to not only look at, you know, their hospital needs or, or planning needs for their estate, but also their, their family needs as far as if something happens, who, you know, would be able to provide in what capacity. Everyone has a toolkit. And so instead of kind of like, you know, clearing up or addressing the expectations that are unrealistic or the confusion, how do you, what, if anything, do you think would be important to families to 
have that conversation if and when a loved one um, becomes ill and, and the degree of care not from a hospital, but within the family unit. Very important to have this conversation, but even though you have this conversation, many times it doesn't work out that way. In a large family, each person has a role, but they many times cannot carry out their role. Now I had five brothers and sisters. I lived out of town. So my role was different than my uh, bro other brothers and sisters who stayed in Alliance. We had one sister who didn't work and I'm sorry to say, the burden of caring for my mother basically fell on her. Even though my brothers and my other sister helped, but they worked. But I will say, in caring for my mother, everybody did everything they could do. And one thing that I remember distinctly, it didn't matter if it was my brother, my sister, myself, or the grandkids. Everybody would put my mother on the bedpan and take her off. We knew that was our mother. It didn't matter that uh, it was her son. They did exactly what her daughters did. And then in some families, role expectations can be so difficult. You usually find one person that does the majority of the caretaking. This is one major reason that uh, caretakers uh, get burned out. And as I was talking before about asking for help, sometimes you ask for help and it, it still doesn't come. So there are many, many, many different situations that a caregiver may find themselves in in the family unit. Did that answer? Yeah, I, I think so. I think it, it helps the audience as well. Thank you. What are some symptoms of caregiver fatigue? Feeling overwhelmed or constantly worried. Feeling tired all the time. Becoming easily irritated and, or angry. Losing interest in activities you used to enjoy. Feeling sad. Having frequent headaches, bodily aches, or physical problems. At this point, we're going to ask and move on to Dion. Good morning, and thank you, Susie, for sharing your story on this topic of caregiving that impacts so many families and so many lives. So thank you so much. We are going to take a quiz now. I'm going to give you some time. The poll will pop up. So there are 10 questions. We just like you to answer the questions. And at the end, we're going to recap. And then after we recap, we will be moving on to Miss Jackie Good. So please answer the questions and we will give you a few minutes to do that and we will summarize. Give it another minute. All right. 
right, about 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so if you see the poll on your screen, there are about 10 questions. It should be in the middle of your screen. You can read the questions and answer. They are multiple choice. And once you finish the quiz, we will go over the questions. So if you have any problems seen in the middle, let me, let me know. No one will see your answer, so it is anonymous. Okay, so I am going to, here we go. Thank you for advancing the quiz slides. Alrighty, we're about to wrap up and just go through. So like I said, this quiz was just for you to get a better understanding of maybe where you're at. Susie talked about the caregiver fatigue and the quiz questions reflect to see if you may have that fatigue and recognizing those symptoms and how to move forward. So Miss Jackie Good will be helping us on how to move forward if you are a caregiver who finds yourself fatigued. But I want to thank you for taking time for answering the questions and hope that they were helpful and gave you time to be insightful and reflect on your journey as a caregiver. So I would like to introduce Ms. Jacqueline Good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, well, I, I'd like to tell my story. Uh, it's kind of complicated, but uh, I'm willing to give it a try. I, I was a caregiver for my husband up until he died um, in 2013. Now, when he started to get ill, it was a slow, gradual onset. It started with uh, him going to the hospital for a procedure that um, he had and he was let go that same day. He was also told to come home and stay in bed or take it easy for another 24 hours, which he did not do. But anyway, uh, he later uh, developed a urinary tract infection. And urinary tract infections in, in men can be very different than they are in women. And I think he had let it go to the point and he did not like to complain. He had let it get to the point where it was just almost unbearable. So I took him back to, to the hospital, took him to the doctor and he sent him to the hospital. And that's what he had, a urinary tract infection. They had him uh, on antibiotics and it did not seem to be helping. So they put him on vanco, vancomycin. And he was on, um, precautions uh, as far as visitors and whatnot and the nurses because we had the gown and glove when we went in to take care of him. Um, that vancomycin seemed to help and he became uh, better. So in becoming better and being in the hospital, he had gotten to the point where he uh, was not able to walk very well. So he was sent to a rehab to increase his strength. And he did pretty good in that, but he was anxious to come home. 
my husband, like all men, do not like to ask for, did not like to ask for uh, anything. He felt like he could do it himself or get it himself. So it was a battle with him. Uh, it was quite a challenge, you know, getting him to relax and sit down because he couldn't do a whole lot. And he had a walker and he seemed to be doing pretty good. Well, while he was in the hospital, in the uh, rehab, um, let me just say he was being treated by the doctor for an infected toe on his left, on his right foot. Uh, while he was in the rehab, they did not take care of the toe um, as they should have. And when I asked about it, they said they had not received any instructions or orders about it. So I began right away to take care of it. Uh, we brought him home and it was to be changed every day, um, an ointment put on it. So he was not moving a whole lot, although he did try to walk. I encouraged him to walk and I walked with him um, around the house and outside in the backyard. But uh, he took a shower, uh, had a shower chair. He put the uh, plastic bag over his foot and put the uh, bandage around it and then he got in the shower. Well, some water got in the bag and Anyway, a couple of days later, it was the toe was red and swollen. So another trip to the doctor, another trip to the hospital, and the doctor told him that that toe would have to be amputated. So, you know, he, like I said, like all men, he did not like the idea of uh, his body image changing, but he he went along with it and he had the toe amputated. So he again went to rehab to try and get himself together to learn how to walk. It was the second toe on his, on his uh, left, on his right foot. So he did okay, but he was still in a hurry to get home. So I brought him home and he was pretty good at home. <clears throat> and during this time, I was, uh, I had a daycare. I was running a daycare, home daycare, and I had uh, two assistants who were very helpful to me as far as the children. Um, I would be there in the morning for, for them and uh, in the afternoon when they left, but then most of my waking hours were spent there at the rehab. So when I brought him home, um, I still had the daycare and I still had him. So he uh, began to complain about this, uh, the other toe that was on the same, same foot that was giving him problems. And we went back to the doctor and the doctor told him that he probably was going to have to amputate that toe also. Well, the night before surgery, you know your NPO, and he was supposed to be NPO. The nurse, uh, he said, the nurse left a banana on his nightstand, so he ate it. So he could not have surgery that, uh, that day. So he had to wait uh, another day for him to get the surgery. Well, by that time, uh, he went into surgery. He was having a problem with the third toe. And the doctor came out and he said that he had, uh, I can't think of the name of the gangrene now, but he had gangrene on that foot. That's why it was, it was spreading so rapidly. So uh, I asked him what was the plan and he said uh, that they would amputate the, uh, the toe because I had gotten pretty upset with him after, this, after the first toe and I asked him, what could be done and he was like put the ointment on and, and uh, bandage it every day which I was doing sometimes twice a day and I asked him uh, instead of taking all these toes why don't you find out what the problem is uh, before you do this because if, uh, you know you're taking another toe eventually he's going to come back and have something else done so uh, they did do some tests and he um, 
he wound up having that gangrene. And so what happened was my husband was in surgery. They talked to him before he went under and uh, gave, he gave the doctor consent. And that's when the doctor came out and talked to me and told me that they were gonna have to amputate that part of his foot, all of the toes, you know. So when he came to himself, when I saw him in um, post-op, he was very, very upset because he did not like the idea of having uh, his foot amputated like that, you know, part of his foot amputated like that. He was very upset. So we discussed it. I talked to him. I tried to give him courage, um, encourage him to go to the rehab like they wanted him to and to uh, get that foot straightened out and then he would be fitted for a prosthesis and no one would you know we, you wouldn't be able to really tell the difference so he did after uh, several days in the hospital he went to rehab and he was getting out of bed they were helping him out of bed that same day the next day they were helping him out of bed. And I don't know whether he thought he was gonna fall or whether they let him go or whatever, but he put his weight on that on that foot that he'd had surgery on and it just burst the stitches. So when the stitches ruptured, naturally it was just a big open gaping wound. So they, they called, well, I was there, I, came shortly after that and, and I said, you know, let's take him to the hospital. So we took him to the hospital and the doctor said, uh, well, it's not gonna do very much good to stitch it because it was so swollen. He said, let's uh, just let it heal from the inside out. And once it heals, we will, uh, you know, think about getting him a prosthetic. So that was, uh, you know, he was walking with the aid of the walker. And so I brought him home and he had, a, I got a wheelchair. He had a motorized wheelchair. He had the walker. He had the uh, bedside commode. And they also uh, provided a bed for him. So in the morning, uh, and we, I still had the children. And they thought it was just so much fun to get on that motorized wheelchair and ride from the bedroom to the to the area where they were uh, with him. They just thought it was just a great great joy because they were riding with G-Paw. So anyway, he uh, did play with the kids a lot. He read them stories and whatnot. But anyway, um, in the morning before they came, he, he my husband was an early riser, so he was up at 5.30, 6 o'clock. I would get up and uh, get him prepared for the day. I would give him, uh, you know, bathe, he bathe himself, his face and his upper body, and I would take care of the rest. I also did exercises with him so that his, his joints would stay mobile and uh, he, he would be able to move around. Uh, I helped him to turn in bed and um, anyway, he'd get in that chair, I'd help him in that wheelchair. We had a, a board that he was, I would raise the bed as high as it would go and then remove the arm from the wheelchair and he would use that board to slide into the chair. Now, um, and then, you know, he would come into the room to where we were and I fixed his breakfast. I fixed his lunch with the children and when they left, I also fixed his dinner. But in the meantime, um, I, he had things that he wanted, such as water, a uh, magazine, or give him the phone to call somebody. It was, it was just a constant um, movement on my part and with the children. And I say, thank God for the helpers. But um, he eventually, I eventually had to give up the children because he became a full-time um, job. And I would 
leave him to go to the store. He was okay. I would leave him to go to the store, but I found myself rushing. You know, I, the lines were too long. Uh, the traffic was too slow. I just had to rush back to him because I don't know uh, if he needed something, could he get it? Although he had that motorized wheelchair, if he was getting getting it okay or what. So there was nobody here but him. So um, I would rush back and I found myself rushing to do a lot of things to make him comfortable. Uh, between when he took his nap, I would do the washing, I would try to clean. Um, I, I very seldom took a nap at night. He, uh, we would, I would be asleep. He would be asleep. I thought he was asleep, and I would go to sleep. And then he would wake up. He want the remote. He, he just want me to, to be there. So I was there. I slept on a futon in his room. We had uh, changed one room in the house for him. So I slept, I slept on the futon so I could be close to him to give him what he needed. Um, several times I had to call an ambulance to take him to the hospital and they would uh, treat him and keep him for a couple of days. So I would always have to call one of the children in the evening to come and pick me up. Um, our conference, our, our regional conference for Kaida Fies, Susie knows about this. Um, is in the April of every year at the end of April. And so I wanted to go to the conference. I had discussed it with him and he said, okay. So I asked two of our children, well, I asked the, all of them if they would come over and uh, stay with him. I mean, to stay with him, not leave him and uh, take care of him while I was gone. Because at this time he, the doctor had finally said he was diabetic. So I was giving him insulin and uh, you know, taking care of his foot and all this other stuff. Uh, they agreed. The conference was from Thursday to Sunday. So I left Thursday early, th we left the early Thursday morning and I came back as soon as I could on Sunday. Uh, I can't remember where it was exactly, but it was pretty close, uh, like Detroit or somewhere in Indiana, whatever. But anyway, um, when I came back, my son, my oldest son and my youngest daughter asked me, who helped me take care of him? How did I get him in and out of bed? How did I get him in and out of the car? Because uh, we had doctor's appointments and he had to keep them. And I told them, you know, I did with the help of the board, you know, I lifted him and put him in, the, help him get in the car, lifted him and helped him get out and uh, also in the bed. So they just thought, the two of them, they were just worn out. They just couldn't, they, they didn't see how. <laughs> it was, it, I was taking care of him on my own. So anyway, uh, maybe about a couple weeks after that, my daughters got together and they got a person to come in and help take care of him. Well, she did, she came in, she came in three days a week and she would um, help him with whatever he needed. But usually he was in a rush. He wanted to get out of bed before she got there at eight o'clock. So he, he, I had gotten him up and he had washed up and whatnot and I had finished bathing him and he would get in the chair. And so he was there to talk, to, you know, she was there to talk to him and give him different things. And while she was doing this, I would either do the wash or run to the store or whatever I had to do. Um, and as I said, we went a couple times to the hospital. I had to call the ambulance. Well, this particular Saturday morning, um, the this, this Saturday before this, uh, a week prior, his one of his best friends had had a massive heart attack and died. So I was kind of hesitant to give him the news, but um, I told him and and he, he understood it. And I also told him about his brother who was very close to him and he was sick. He had, uh, his cancer had returned. He had laryngeal cancer and uh, he had been cancer free for years and it had returned and he had gotten progressively worse also. 
But anyway, uh, I told him about his best friend. So that particular Saturday morning when they were going to have the services for his friend, I had gotten him dressed and everything. And I told him, I said, I am going to go down to the church and I'm not going to stay. I'm just going to say something to Peggy and sign the book and then I'll be back. Well, he he was not himself. He was he was just acting strange, you know. Uh, he he want. I said I'm going to uh, Madison's funeral, and he's like, "Who's Madison?" And I I knew something was not right, so I called my uh, my son, the oldest one, and he wasn't in. So I called the younger one, and he said, "Well, uh, I'll call the ambulance," and he he did. Uh, he, he said he was going to, but in the meantime, the older one called back and he said, well, Ma, just call the ambulance and take him to any hospital because we had been going to Metro and that's where I wanted him to go because they knew everything about him. But he said, Ma, if he needs to go to the hospital, take him to, call the ambulance and let them take him to the nearest one. I said, okay. So I, I did, I called the ambulance and uh, they came but I had uh, put a couple of things in a bag, you know, like a lunch or something, because they always sent me back home and I had to, um, I usually rode with them. And so I would uh, call somebody to come and get me. But this time when they picked him up, they told me to uh, say, maybe you better drive because we don't know how, if we we're gonna keep him or how long. And I said, okay, so I grabbed, a little lunch bag and a couple of magazines because I was pretty sure that he was going to be coming back home and I wouldn't have to call anybody. So when I um, I got to, I got to the hospital first and I told the lady they said they were going to um, university and I went in and I told the lady at the desk that my husband was coming in. I had seen them bringing him in and they told me I could see him when he got inside. So she, she said, okay, she said, just have a seat there. I'll call you when they're ready. And I went in, I uh, was sitting there and they, I, they took him to a room and they didn't call me right away. So when they did call me, um, I went in and they had all this, all this equipment that we usually have for a code. And I heard somebody say, uh, um, sodium bicarb and uh, ephedrine and all this stuff that for a heart coat and he did have a bad heart so uh, they were working with him so I and it was so crowded with the equipment and stuff and they were trying to get an IV in and I said um, the, the one person asked me she said would you want to step outside the room because it's kind of crowded in here and uh, there's not much you can do right now. So I did and I was standing there and my oldest son got there and the uh, doctor came out and she said, well, we have given him uh, three jokes to the heart and it, it doesn't seem to be helping. He's not coming back. So she said, you can go in and talk to him he can still hear you. He, his eyes are closed, but you can go in and talk to him because he probably can hear you. And my son and I went in and we were talking to him and we were encouraging him to, you know, to, to just wake up, to come be here with us. Um, we, we needed him. And, but that was it. He was gone. But I know, I, I do know that in the, and please forgive me, the time that I was taking care of him, I, I didn't have anything for myself. I didn't have an out. Um, so to me, to not do the activities that I usually do, like crocheting or reading or bowling, it, it didn't matter because all I asked God for was the strength the strength to take care of him. Give me the strength to, to be able to do for him 
and get him better. And that's all I ever wanted. You know, I, I really didn't care about um, going out doing things because uh, everyone knew that I was taking care of him and I wasn't going to go anywhere anyway. But um, after he passed, maybe a week or two after he passed, was when, um, you know, it must have been two, three weeks, I, it, the, the realization slowly dawned on me that I was getting depressed or was depressed. I, I didn't care whether I got out of bed. Um, I would get out of bed and I would um, take a shower and I'd go back to bed. I, it wasn't, uh, I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to do anything. And reading was uh, one of my joys. Um, I didn't want to read. Um, I did read scripture in the Bible. That didn't seem to help. I just prayed to God. Um, I was just really not me. You know, I didn't have any energy. I didn't want to do anything. So I did go to, I had an appointment with my primary doctor um, to see, um, just to check up. And when I went, I told him some of the things I was feeling. And he said, you need to see a therapist. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend this therapist to you. So I went to, the uh, idea. I said, okay, I'm going to go. Um, I went to see this uh, psychologist and it, it didn't matter one way or the other, whatever he said, I, <laughs> I just went along with it because, you know, uh, I didn't have any, any plans for anything, you know. And so he said, I would like for you to see the psychiatrist. And I was like, oh, now they think I'm crazy. <laughs> so, uh, I went to see the psychiatrist, I made an appointment, I went to see her, and I said to myself, I'm thinking all along, I'm, I'm a nurse, and I was really blaming myself because I didn't see any of this coming on with my husband, although I had to, uh, gotten to the point where I had to turn him, I had to clean him up after he, after I had put him on the bedside commode, I had to feed him in the end, um, because he, you know, he fed himself and stuff. It, it uh, I didn't have anything to do. I didn't have, you know, everything that I was caring for, living for, was gone. So I didn't have anything to do. And um, I went to see her, and I was telling her some of this, and she was like, "Well, you, I, I, you know, I think just to tell you to be honest, you're depressed, and I'm going to give you some medication." It's a antidepressant, and I want you to take this and uh, see how you do, and I'll see you in six weeks. Maybe by that time, we should have some sort of uh, way you're going to be going up. You're going to be feeling better about doing stuff, or maybe you won't. So I did. I took the medication. I would go to the grocery store for groceries, and I'd find myself rushing thinking that I had to get back home to take care of my husband. And I had to really put the skids on and say, you know, why are you rushing? We don't have anybody at home um, to take care of. You know, if I was out in traffic and it was going slow or people weren't moving as fast as I thought they should because I was in a hurry to get back home, I didn't have to do that anymore. So it was, um, it was all the things that Susie had talked about. Uh, my children were a big help. They would come over sometimes at night, but they came at night because they worked during the day. And in the evening, you know, they would, they had their families. And so they would come by and if I needed them, they would come. But I didn't think anybody could take care of my husband the way that I could take care of him the way I wanted to take care of him. And it was a very demanding, challenging uh, experience. And I, I wouldn't trade it because like I said, it was just, 
I, I just wanted to take care of him. I wanted him to have the best care that he could have. And I felt like I could give it to him. So um, it was kind of difficult for me to, after he was gone, to really get back in the swing of things. I had no energy. I didn't want to do anything. Um, and when I had been in bed, I had stayed in bed. And just, I said, you know, this is not you. What, what's going on here? What, but I didn't realize that I was depressed. I just didn't realize it. So this uh, journey to my primary physician who recommended the psychologist to me, who recommended the uh, psychiatrist to me, who keeps telling me that I need to get out and meet people and uh, join, she said, <laughs> join some uh, dating apps. Like, <sighs> I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, I may be meeting a serial killer or uh, whatever, a pedophile or whatever. So I just leave that to the Lord. I'm not just I'm not gonna do that. But um, I joined a support group and that was really, you know, other women, I, I uh, saw what they had been through and what I had gone through. So it was really, uh, it was really a rough go. And I would advise anybody who is a caregiver, if you're in the Cleveland area, call me. I understand what you're going through. Um, I will be there to to give you a couple hours break so you can see a movie and feel comfortable leaving your loved ones in my care. Um, I, 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 I should have done that. But uh, I, I think when my son and daughter told me that it was just a bit much, I mean, how did you do it? Um, it was too much for them. I thought, you know, well, they're probably because they, they have jobs and they have uh, homes and whatnot, although they took those three days off to be there with him. They had things that they had to do, so they were already tired. I was home all day. I wasn't working. I had given up to kids when the last one went to school. Um, and, and it was just me to take care of him, and I just felt like I could do the best job of taking care of him. And maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't know. I, that thought always uh, comes to mind sometimes. Did I do the best that I could under the circumstances? And should I have been more cognizant of how he was going down? But I, I did, I, I think I realized that, and that's why we spent so much time at the doctor's office and in the hospital. But um, we just can't, I, I, sometimes it just, there's that doubt there. So I hope I haven't bored you with any details. Um, it was quite a journey, that's all I can say. And I thank God, I thank God that he gave him to me for 51 years. And I thank God that I had the strength. He gave me the strength to do this, to take care of him. And then that he also gave me the insight uh, to talk with my primary and uh, get the help that I needed. I wish that I had seen this uh, presentation before I started this caregiving episode, but anyway, hopefully it may help somebody else, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Jackie. Um, your story is very powerful and compelling, and I, I, I do think that if at least one, <clears throat> one person that resonates with, then I, I, I think that you know, you you definitely met your 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 point and your purpose with us this morning. You know, there there were a couple of takeaways before we move on that 
I kind of like to, to talk to you and possibly Susie about. And the one thing that I kept hearing, the one theme that I, I wrote down was the idea of support. That, you know, there were kind of critical points where people stepped in. Um, your, your children when you were away at a conference. And then that kind of snowballing or rolling into having what you call helpers who then came in on a, on a um, I guess, a more consistent basis, more, you know, longer basis than on a discrete time from, from, your, from your children. And you, you talk about a, a shift at some point where from when you were getting support to where you eventually received support. You talked about taking care of your husband. You described it as a full-time job. And even though support that you gave was very outward looking as far as, you know, the support you gave and care for someone else. Um, can you tell us as far as the importance of the idea of support and care and, and, and inward looking? I, I, I think that, you know, you, you mentioned about receiving medication and, and talking to a professional. Um, but since you described giving support as a full-time job, do, do you think that the support that you were able to receive, um, that you were able to accept and, and to receive, has that helped you as far as kind of your journey from um, caregiver to, to Jackie again? Um, I, I think it did. I, in fact, I know it did. Um, it helped me tremendously because I found uh, e eventually over a period of time, um, I got a dog who is, thinks he's human and uh, we, he's, very, he's a lot of company. I do go out. Um, I go out to eat, I visit friends. Well, not so much as visit, but we get together for lunch or whatever. Um, I go bowling. I read a lot now more and I crochet. I've, I've been crocheting Afghans for my grandchildren who graduated from college and that's been kind of keeping me busy um, and reading and stuff. And I um, started back work as a travel nurse. So I, I think um, the support that I received um, from various sources and of course for my children. And I had to be strong for them when this first happened. So really and truly, there was no one who was there for me. My husband was uh, the six, seven, he was like, uh, the, he had 13 sisters and brothers. And he and his, the baby girl were the only two that were left because his brother that was, was uh, nearest him in age had passed like in March and he wasn't able to attend the funeral because he was in the hospital. So we uh, screened it in, what do you call it? It wasn't Zoom then, it was something else. But right. he, something like right. that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. He was able to see it. We were able to see uh, the services uh, through Skype. And so uh, he's always he was always a strong will, strong mind person. And uh, I just wanted to take care of him the way that he had taken care of me. Mm -hmm. And to be perfectly honest with you, this is the first time since he died uh, that I have ever been on my own. Because I went from my mother's house at uh, 16 to my husband's house. And that was, and we've been together ever since then. So it was uh, just quite a, you know, and he, he took very good care of me, I must say, he helped me through school. Uh, he went to school, I helped him as far as, you know, taking whatever I could off of him so he could study. And he did the same for me and I really appreciate, it. he gave me the support that I needed in order to get to where I am now. And I find myself going back you know, to be an old Jackie. Uh, I can laugh, I can make jokes, I can um, listen with more compassion 
and be able to understand more because I've taken that journey. And it's, uh, it's, it's I'm, I must say, although it was, it did not end the way I wanted it to end, mm-hmm. I take away from that uh, experience that I had. It made me a stronger person. It made me see things in a different light. So, um, I, I will be, like I say, more uh, dedicated, more committed, have more compassion to someone in that same, you know, who's going through that same thing. Thank you. And the, the, I have a, a question, and if um, our attendees, our audience today, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, that Ms. West uh, described earlier this morning as part of the webinar tips for Zoom. But I have a general question for uh, both our guest speaker, Jackie, and our presenter, Susie. And, you know, it it strikes me that both of you have medical backgrounds, that you're both registered nurses, and that you've given um, care as, as part of a profession, as a career. And we've talked today about caregiver fatigue, but I wanted to kind of talk more general about your thoughts on caregiving fatigue as medical professionals and and families. Oftentimes our family members, friends will solicit help, support just in general on a, on a day to day or, or just a one-off basis and how, you know, what, what are your thoughts over time in addition to, to these very heart-wrenching, difficult experiences that you each have had with close family members? As far as kind of the general idea of, of caregiving as part of, you know, doing your, your, your calling and your job and how that translates to what you may be called upon or what you provide in your personal lives on a more informal basis over time. In my case, in my case, I have been around a lot of sick people. People have asked me questions about their condition. My answer, I try to answer their questions as to the best of my ability with what I think may be the problem that they're experiencing. But I have always, always suggested in the end of my recitation with them that they need to see their physician. I never want anybody to take what I tell them I think might be wrong as gospel. So that is my experience with uh, friends and even strangers that come up because they know you're a nurse and they want to ask you, well, what do you think this is? Or what do you think that is? I probably have a very, very good idea of the problem, but I still request, I still want them to talk to their physician because I never wanted said that, oh, she told me this and it wasn't right. And and I agree with Susie. Uh, I do listen and I have a pretty good idea of what's going on, what what they may, a nursing diagnosis, as we call it, but I always tell them to seek their physician because, you know, what, when you assume, you know what happens when you assume. And I also do not want to uh, give them the impression that I know something and they go to the doctor and it's something else. So, uh, you know, you go to your doctor, you make sure of what it is. And then uh, maybe you can come back and tell me, oh, that's, you know, uh, I went to the doctor, such and such. Well, it may have been what I was thinking. And then again, it may not have been. So I'm glad I didn't say anything uh, to them as far as uh, exactly what it was, their problem was. They should always seek 
uh, their position. Don't uh, we can listen, but we don't make the diagnosis. Absolutely, we never we listen. We may give some advice, but we mm -hmm. never diagnose. Yeah. Now, I don't want to come across that I'm hard because I've always, as a child coming up, I always wanted to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. very few people that get to do what their dreams are. I dreamed of being a nurse. I would take all the kids off the street and, and take their temperatures and <laughs> pretend I was the doctor. Um, and I've always had a passion for people and helping people. You're welcome. That was Thank my you. sentiments exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. And, and again, thank you, Jackie, for your testimony and story. And I, I hope that you're able to take your time these days and, and to not rush. I do. At the grocery store and, and, and anywhere else. And, and just- in, Two in hours to get $15 worth of groceries. <laughs> well, just don't go to Target with that, with that in mind. It won't be $15. To <laughs> but again, I'm hoping that you're, you're not rushing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Susie Rice at this time to continue uh, on with our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, oh, thank you. Back a lot of memories. <laughs> Regardless of your particular circumstances, being a family caregiver is a challenging role. How to prevent caregiver fatigue? How can we prevent caregiver fatigue? First, be grateful. Caring for someone you love brings challenges and stress, but it also gives you opportunities to make someone else's life easier. It may be the last time that you're able to spend with that loved one. Another prevention is exercise. Staying active physically helps reduce stress and improve moods. Eat healthy. Because you're a caregiver, we tend to just grab anything we can so that we could get back to that person we're taking care of. But plan nutritious diets for yourself to keep your energy level up. Find support. Take time each week to talk to family members or friends. Some caregivers have to seek counseling and that's all right. Don't ever be ashamed or afraid to talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, find support groups. Uh, they can be especially helpful. Next slide, please. How to prevent caregiver fatigues? Keep a journal. A journal is always a good place to record what went on that day. Keep an eye on your health. Reportedly, 70% of caregivers become sick with health issues. Also, when I read that 50% of caregivers die before the person to whom they're providing care with, that was astounding to me. I never dreamed that 50% of the caregivers might not live as long as the person they're caregiving. Meditate, nurture your body and your mind. Consider activities that help you relax. Music, yoga, any of those things may help the caregiver to slow down and put things in perspective. Next slide, please. The slide before that one, I think. Ways to care for yourself continued. 
Okay. Self-compassion is essential to self-care. Being kind to yourself uh, builds the foundation. Even if it's just a few minutes a day, take time to care for yourself. Practice simple breathing awareness for 10 minutes a day. Breathe in slowly through your nose for five counts. Hold and pause for five counts and then exhale for five counts. Continue this exercise for 10 minutes each day. I'm going to repeat this because we're going to practice it. Breathe through your nose for five counts. Hold and pause for five counts and exhale, exhale for five counts. Let's practice. How did that feel? Did it help you relax a little bit? Hopefully it did, and hopefully this is something you can continue to do. Can we have the slide for the support and resources, please? These are places in Cleveland, you can jot them down if you care to, that you may be able to call or go to for support as a caregiver. There's a place in Beechwood. There's a place in Cleveland. Faith-based support groups for family members, Cuyahoga Valley Faith Bank, Beechwood, Meadowburg Heights, um, Alzheimer's Association. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Can Can we have closing remarks by our president, Elizabeth Jones? Thank you, Susie. This was an excellent presentation today. I um, have a few takeaways. can't seem to get my camera off on, but that's okay. We'll move forward. Okay, there I am. Yes. <laughs> okay, I have a few takeaways. Um, explore and find resources available to you for support as a caregiver, i.e. support groups, um, that there are varying types of um, caregiving. That's something new I learned today. That um, we need to be mindful of our roles and expectations and boundaries. It's okay to ask for help. It's easier said than done, but try and maintain some normalcy in your life. And above all, remember, if you do not take care of yourself, you will not be able to take care of others. So I would like to thank our presenter today again for increasing our awareness about caregiving and how to take care of ourselves. I would like to close with, I hope everyone continues to commit to staying safe, practicing social distancing, sheltering at home, and listening to the medical doctors, scientists, and CDC for medical advice and not our politicians as we move forward in our new life 
or living with COVID-19. Again, thank you for joining today's webinar.